If you have your Bibles this evening, I want to turn your attention tonight to the book of Genesis, chapter number 37. Genesis 37. And if you don't mind, just one more time, let's, let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read in Genesis 37, and I'm going to read just a couple verses as well in the book of Ecclesiastes. Beginning at verse number 18 of Genesis 37, the Bible says, And they saw him from afar. This is speaking of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's brothers saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued Joseph out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. Notice this, church, that he might rescue him out of their hand, to restore him to his father. I like that. Reuben has this secret plan that nobody knows about. Joseph is getting ready to die. But Reuben has this secret plan that he's going to lift Joseph out of the pit for the purpose of restoring him back to his father. That sounds a lot like Jesus to me tonight. How many would declare that this is your testimony? Jesus pulled us out of the pit and he has reconciled us back to the Father. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Verse 23, let's read a few more verses. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, now Judah's going to go fight for Joseph. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. And when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and where shall I go? Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12, one more verse. Solomon says, Though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And the church said, Amen. I want to speak to you for a few moments tonight on the power of a threefold cord. Father, we just thank you tonight. Your anointing is in this house. I thank you for this worship team. I thank you for these singers and musicians. I thank you that your presence is here. Your people are here tonight. God, I just thank you for everyone who has come back tonight and given of their time and, and their energy. And Father, I just pray tonight that you would be with us, that you would speak to us as only you can. Give us a word from you. Father, move Travis out of the way tonight and allow your Holy Spirit to speak in this place as only you can. Father, help me to decrease that you would increase in Jesus' name. We give all glory, honor, and praise to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Will you clap your hands and give God one more great praise before you find your seat? The power of a threefold cord. One of my favorite elements to the Word of God is something called symbolism, uh, typology, allegory. You know, there's something in biblical studies called hermeneutics. That's a fancy word, but hermeneutics 
simply has to do with how we interpret the Scripture. So one of the basic laws of biblical hermeneutics says the Word of God is always right. The Word of God is perfect. The Word of God is infallible. Uh, There are no flaws in the Word of God. But sometimes our interpretation of the Word of God can be flawed or mistaken. One of the basic laws of Bible hermeneutics or Bible interpretation says that the Word of God should always be interpreted literally unless there is obvious symbolism, allegory, typology involved. Let me give you just a couple examples of what I'm talking about. In John chapter 19, Jesus tells the Jews, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll build it back just like it was. They interpret what he's telling them in a literal context, but he's not speaking to them in a literal context. He's giving them symbolism. They look back at him and they say, it took 46 years to build this temple, this structure in Jerusalem, and you're telling us you're going to build it back in three days? But the Bible says he was not talking about the temple as in a church building, but he was talking about the temple of his body. So much so that the Bible says when he died and was crucified, and three days later he got up, John 19 records that his disciples remembered what he said about the temple and it clicked. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll get up again. It was symbolism. It was allegory. Another example would be Luke chapter 15. When Jesus says, which one of you having a hundred sheep and one of those sheep goes astray and leaves the ninety-nine would not go after that lost sheep. And if you go out and you find him and he's left the sheepfold and he's gone astray, but you go out and you search for him and you find him, which one of you would not rejoice and celebrate and throw that sheep on your shoulders and bring him back to the flock and restore him to the sheepfold? It's a beautiful story, but Jesus is not speaking in literal context. He's not talking about sheep. Right? He's talking about human beings. He's talking about souls. He's talking about the church. Right? He's talking about which one of you, like at Tabernacle of Praise, if someone in the flock were to leave and go astray, would not go after him. And if you went after him and he was gone astray and he'd come back and you brought him back and restored him back to the church, to the sheepfold, would not rejoice and celebrate and say, our lost brother that was lost, he has now been found. He has been restored. It was symbolism. It's typology. It's one of my favorite elements to the Word of God. Then there is the literal Scripture. Right? Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. Right? When the Bible says, Thou shalt not lie, or thou shalt not steal. You don't have to study the Greek and the Hebrew there. You don't have to be a Bible theologian and try to figure out the deeper meaning. It's a literal context. Don't lie to people. Don't say things that are not true. This is what hermeneutics teach us. There's the literal text and then there is the symbolic text. It's a beautiful thing. As we read this text tonight about Joseph and his brothers, I believe that if we apply biblical hermeneutics to this text that we will find that there's a lot of symbolism and there's a lot of things within this story of Joseph and his brothers that relate to us right now and are relevant to the church today. First of all, the Bible says that Joseph, he was, when all of this was going on, he was a teenager. The Bible actually says during this time in Genesis that he was 17 years old when he began to have this feud with his brothers when they threw him into this pit. So Joseph speaks to us of of a Gabriel. He speaks to us of a a young man, uh, a teenager, a youth, a student. All right? 
But the Bible says when Joseph at a young age, at 17 years old, was thrown into this pit by his brothers, the scripture said it was Reuben that began to speak up and come to Joseph's defense. That's interesting because Reuben was the oldest son. He was the oldest brother. Some suggest that Reuben would have been around 13 years older than Joseph. So so catch this now. We see this story about Joseph on one end of the spectrum and Reuben on the other end of the spectrum. The young generation and the older generation. Right? The Reuben speaks to us of somebody that's just been there and done that. Got a little more experience with life. Just got a little more wisdom. He's, he's seen more. He's experienced more. And you've got Joseph on one end and you've got Reuben on the other end. You've got the young and you've got the old. But then it mentions the other brother in the text. It mentions the brother by the name of Judah. Judah was born between Joseph and Reuben. I love this. Judah in the Bible, his name in the Hebrew means praise or to be praised. Genesis 49 and 8, the Bible says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. So picture this church. Just go on this little journey with me. You've got Joseph, the young generation. You've got Reuben, the older generation. And in between the two, or in the middle of the two, you have Judah. I think this is a beautiful thing. And I think this is a recipe that produces a revival church. I think that this is a recipe and a formula that produces a thriving church. A strong church. What creates a revival church? What creates an anointed church? Is this powerful threefold cord. When you've got the young generation the Joseph, and you've got the old generation, the Reuben, and right smack dab in the middle of them, you have people declaring Judah, he shall be praised, he shall be praised. There is something remarkable about the strength of the young, the zeal of the young, the passion of the young, and the wisdom of the old, the experience of the old, and together, simultaneously, both declaring, he shall be praised. He shall be praised in my life, in this season of my life, in this time of my life. He's going to get the praise. He's going to get the glory in my young years and in my golden years. God shall be praised. It's the power of a threefold cord. David said in Psalm 37, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. What was David saying? He was saying I was Joseph and now I'm Reuben and I'm still praising Jesus and I'm still giving him the glory and I'm still living for him. It's a powerful formula. What creates a thriving church is when the young people say, God's going to get these years of my life. God's going to get my teenage years. I think one of the greatest lies that the devil tells our young people, and i got to be honest, I think it's something that a lot of parents tell young people, and that is, you've got all this time. Like, just live it up now. Like, just enjoy these years. You can serve God when you're 40. You can do what God's called you to do later in life. Don't waste these years. You know, when when that woman with the alabaster box come to Jesus and she emptied it, the Bible said it cost her one year's salary. And and it was expensive perfume, costly perfume. She emptied it on the feet of Jesus And they look at her and they say, Judas, I think it was, that said, what a waste. We could have have fed the poor with that. We could have done this with that. What a waste. And that's the lie that the devil tells young people. Don't waste your teenage years. Don't waste your millennial years. Live it up. You can do something for the Lord down the line. But I want to say to every young person in this room tonight, let God know. And let the devil know, 
He's going to get these years of my life. God's going to get my teenage years. God's going to get my childhood years. Listen, the Bible says, Remember the Lord in the days of your youth. Let no man despise your youth. I know what it is as a child to come to church at nine years old and ten years old and feel the power of God and feel the presence of God and feel the Holy Spirit begin to whisper to me about my calling and my assignment at a young age. You don't have to wait to be great. You don't have to wait until it's too late. You can be a Joseph and you can do something great for God now. When the young people say, He's going to get my teenage years. And the older, not old, the older people say, He's going to get my golden years. Noah did his best work at an older age. God used him mightily. And what we see here is a formula for a thriving church. It's when you've got Joseph on one side, Reuben on the other side, and Judah in the middle. The young and the old, and in the middle, Judah and together declaring, he shall be praised. He shall be praised. Genesis 37 says that after Reuben spoke up, the oldest brother and says, listen, we don't have to kill Joseph. We don't have to kill our brother. After him, the Bible said Judah began to speak up. He said, listen, let's not kill him. He is our brother. And the Bible said after Judah came to Joseph's defense, the Bible said that Joseph was lifted out of the pit. He was, lift, he was about to die. He was getting ready to be killed by his brothers. But Judah spoke up and said, let him live. We don't have to shed his blood. Don't kill him. And after Judah began to speak in Joseph's life, the Bible said Joseph was lifted from the pit. I love that. Judah means praise. Praise starts speaking in Joseph's life. Praise takes on a voice and starts declaring life over Joseph. And praise picks Joseph up out of that pit and pulls him out of the pit. I want to tell somebody tonight that this is what praise does in our lives. Praise can pull you out of the pit and push you into victory. Push you into your destiny. Push you into your calling. They lifted Joseph out of the pit. And they pushed him right on into Egypt where he would eventually become the ruler and the reigner of Egypt. I want to say tonight that there's power in your praise. That there's still power in Judah. A couple years ago I did a study in the scripture on praise. There are seven, in the Old Testament, there are seven different manifestations of praise. That the Bible talks about. Or seven different displays of praise. Psalm 42 and verse 5 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation. The word praise in this verse of Scripture is the Hebrew word yada. It means to throw up, to shoot up, or to cast an extended hand. It means to lift up your hands. It's the yada praise. You know, it's interesting that the yada praise is really, it's got two different elements to it. It's like the first element, if you can picture, like my youngest daughter is four years old. And sometimes she just wants daddy to hold her or to pick her up. And she'll come to me and she'll throw up her hands. She'll extend her hands and say, daddy, hold me. And what she's, what she's wanting in that moment is she's just wanting to be held by her father. She's just wanting to be embraced by her father. Pick me up, daddy. You know, the yada praise is the extended hand. 
It's when the child of God comes before the presence of their almighty father and they say, pick me up, daddy. I just need to be held tonight. I, I just can't, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. And I just need to feel the warmth of your embrace. Pick me up tonight, Jesus. Lord, I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to struggle anymore. I want to, I want to surrender. I throw up my hands and I need you to pick me up, Jesus. And then the other element of this is if you've ever seen like the show Cops or anything like that, you know, when, they, when a police officer comes to someone that they think might be suspicious or dangerous, the first thing they tell them is throw up your hands. Let me see your hands. What are they wanting to see? They're wanting to see complete surrendering. No resistance, no pushback, you know, no opposition. Get your hands up. Get your hands where I can see them. The yada praise is an act of surrendering. It's when we come into the presence of God and we say, God, I'm not going to resist tonight. I'm not going to withhold tonight. I don't have so much pride tonight that I'm going to just stand here with my arms folded. But God, I surrender and I give you a yada praise. I extend my hands and I want to let you know I'm not here to fight. Lord, do what you want to do. The Bible says submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you resistance looks like this I'm not going anywhere devil if you want to fight pack a lunch because we're going to be here for a while that's resistance I'm withstanding you. I'm not running away. I'm here to fight. But that's not what surrendering looks like. Sur resistance looks like this. Surrender looks like this. And the Bible says submit to God. Surrender to God and resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Maybe you're here tonight and you feel like the devil's fighting you. And you feel like the devil's tormenting you. And God sent this preacher to T.O.P. tonight to tell somebody in the name of Jesus, surrender to God and resist the devil and watch him flee from you. There's power in our praise. Second Chronicles 20 and 22 says, and when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, come against praise. The devil's going to come against your praise. The devil's going to try to hinder your praise. But God set an ambush against them, and the Bible says they were routed. The word praise in this verse of Scripture is the Hebrew word tehillah. Tehillah. Everybody say tehillah. Not to be confused with tequila, okay? <laughs> tequila. It's a powerful praise. It is a, it is a hymn of praise. The tequila praise, in the Hebrew, it means a spontaneous new song. It's a, it's a hymnal of praise to the Lord that hasn't necessarily been rehearsed. It hasn't been practiced but it's a song, a spontaneous song of praise that just rises in your heart. I was really blessed this morning when Pastor Tyner mentioned that old song that the church used to sing. I can't even remember what it was off the top of my head right now. But, but it just that song just come to him. And when it, when it come to him, I had to start singing it. Uh, I'm going to praise the Lord while I have a chance. That, that's like the Tehillah praise. It's a... It's a spontaneous song that comes to you while you're driving down the road. And, and you say, where did that come from? I hadn't heard that song in 12 years. But it just comes in your spirit and you begin to offer that song to the Lord. It's a, it's a form of worship. There's victory in this kind of stuff. There, there's power in this kind of stuff. The devil runs when, when we begin to give God this kind of praise from our lives. There's power in our praise. I, I remember... A couple years ago, maybe about two years ago now, I have a, a pastor friend who sent me a text. I've known this pastor my entire life. He sent me and my mother and my sister a text. His wife became very sick. They went on vacation. Young couple, uh, around 50 years old. And they had went on vacation 
And all of a sudden, his wife, who has been a family friend of ours, known her all my life, she just started getting sick. And it just started progressing, like, quickly. She started throwing up. She started, it was just, like, getting worse and worse. And it quickly started spiraling out of control. They come home from the vacation. They had to admit her into the hospital. And all of a sudden, like, her organs started shutting down. I think like her kidneys started shutting down different things and it was looking bad fast for this woman. It looked like she was getting ready to die. He's texting me and a few other people and he's saying, I'm just trying to get as many people praying as I can get. It looks bad. We're desperate for a miracle. Please pray. When I got the text, immediately in my spirit, there was this song that came to me. And it was an older song that I hadn't heard in a, in a long time, but the song is by Israel Halton, and it says, Turn it around. Turn it around. Open the windows of heaven. Pour out a blessing. Overflow. And, and I just started singing that song. I mean, it just came to me as soon as I got the text. And I found myself praying that song. God, turn it around. In the name of Jesus Christ, the woman's name's Joy. I said, God, turn it around for Joy. Let there be a turnaround in this situation. I begin to pray. Other people started praying. About 24 hours later, that pastor texted me. He said, we don't know what's going on. The doctors don't know what's going on. But things are getting better. She's improving. And this is what the end of the text message message said he said there's been a turnaround in this situation I've come to tell somebody tonight that there's power in our praise there's power in that spontaneous praise that says God I didn't practice this I didn't rehearse this but here I go I feel it right now and I want to offer it to you I want to give you the praise there's power when we praise him You can be in a bad place and begin to sing and worship God. I don't know about you, but when they started singing tonight and the anointing walked in this room, I started feeling better. Isn't it amazing how praise just has that effect? You can be down, you can be in the pit, but praise will pull you out of the pit and push you into victory. Psalm 103 and verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. The word bless in this scripture is the Hebrew word barak. Barak the Lord, O my soul. Barak His holy name. It means to kneel or to bow. To give reverence to God as an act of adoration. Have you ever been in that kind of atmosphere, church service? Maybe in your prayer closet where you just felt the necessity and the need to bow, to get on your knees, to get on your face. I remember many years ago, at about 19 or 20 years old, at the church I grew up in, was born and raised in, my youth pastor asked me to preach one night. I was just feeling the call of God. I felt the call of God on my life to preach when I was three years old. I had a when I was a child, I had a toy cash register, and on the side of it was a plastic microphone. I tore the microphone off of the cash register, went into my dad's bedroom and got one of his handkerchiefs, and as a young child, I would go throughout the house, and I would preach, man. I felt the call of God to preach, and it didn't matter who was listening and who wasn't listening. I was going to preach it anyway. And I felt the, God, the call of God to preach, but this call be, became, um, God started using me and giving me opportunities to preach when I was around 19 or 20 years old. I would go into the nursing homes, and I would preach in the nursing homes. I mean, if I had an opportunity to preach, it was like I won the lottery. And I'd go into the nursing homes and preach to the elderly, and most of them wouldn't even listen when I, when I was preaching. I remember one night I preached in the nursing home and a fight broke out while I was preaching. I mean, they were fighting while I was preaching. I was like, I don't know what to do right now. They're fighting, but I'm going to preach. And I mean, I just was so grateful for any opportunity. I, please don't anybody start fighting right now while I'm preaching. That would be really bad. But, but I remember my youth pastor one night. He had started these Friday night youth rallies. 
that we were having like once a month. And he said, he said, I want you to preach at the next youth rally. And I was like, oh my goodness, jackpot. I won the lottery. I get to preach. And so I had prepared and I was so excited. I couldn't wait to go to this youth service and preach and use what I felt was, you know, the gift of God in my life. I couldn't wait for this opportunity. And I get there. The service starts, like the praise team singing. Then this young man in the service gets up to sing a song right before I'm going to preach. And he opens his mouth to sing this song. And I mean, the anointing just walks in this room. It was a, just a really slow, sweet song, worship song. And the glory of God came into that room. The presence of God began to manifest in that room. Teenagers are worshiping. People are crying. And he gets done singing this song and just the presence of God is in the room in a powerful way. And I come up to preach. This is my opportunity to preach. I'm 19 or 20 years old. I don't get this opportunity much. I don't get asked to do this much. I got I to gotta use this opportunity. But the presence of God was moving so strong in that service. I remember getting up behind the pulpit and I looked out over those young people. And I said, you know what? I feel like the Holy Spirit is wanting some of us to kneel right now. I feel like the Holy Spirit wants some of us to bow before Him right now. I want you to know they started dropping like flies. Boom, 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 boom. I didn't get to preach that night because the Holy Spirit walked into that room and required us to barack the Lord, required us to get on our knees and begin to worship God. There's power in this stuff, church. There is power when we praise the Lord. Sometimes it's a lifted hand. Sometimes it's a shout. Sometimes it's a dance. Sometimes it's us bowing before Him in reverence and adoration. These things are the keys to victory in our life that pull us out of the pit and push us into victory. The Bible said in Luke chapter 17 that Jesus heals 10 men at the same time of leprosy. This, this shameful, embarrassing disease that caused them to have to be outcasts. They didn't even get to live in the community with their families in their house and They come to Jesus and they're like, have mercy on us. And he immediately touches them and heals them. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Nine of them run away immediately. He's just changed their life. And 90% of them don't even say thank you. And they run away and one comes back and falls down before him and begins to barack him, begins to kneel before him. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus changed our lives. We didn't have a skin disease. We had a sin disease. We didn't have a temporary problem. We had an eternal problem. But Jesus saved us and He changed our lives. And every once in a while, we ought to barack Him. We ought to kneel before Him and bow before His glory. 1 Chronicles 16 and 4 The Bible says, then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke and to thank and to praise the Lord. Everybody say praise. And to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. The word praise in this verse is the Hebrew word halal. It means to boast or to be clamorously foolish and to celebrate. I love this. Now listen, we, we, we've all seen those people that get in church, especially if you are like me and grew up in a Pentecostal church. We, we, all, we all have seen those people that get foolish in the flesh. You, you know what I'm talking about. But, but every once in a while, God doesn't want us to be dignified in our worship, sophisticated in our worship, professionals in our worship. He wants us to allow him. He wants us to. Have you ever seen Tom Brady after he's won one of his 50,000 Super Bowls? Or or, or a LeBron James after he's won a championship? Man, they act foolish. They're screaming. They're going crazy. They're rejoicing. They're celebrating. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says 
when David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, the Bible said when he brought it into the city of Jerusalem, that he danced before the Lord with all of his might. The Bible said that he danced out of his outer garments, that he danced to his wife's embarrassment in front of the whole nation, in front of the governmental officials, in front of all the delegates, in front of his family. He's dancing before the Lord with all of his might. Danced out of his clothes. I don't encourage that tonight. I don't think that anyone, I'm not encouraging anyone to dance out of your clothes. I'm just saying every once in a while we ought to halal the Lord. We ought to say, you know what? I'm not going to be all dignified tonight. If tears fall down my face, I'm going to let that happen. You know, I'm going to, God gave me a word a couple weeks ago for someone in our church. And when I gave this person that word, I started getting emotional. I started choking up. When you have three daughters, let me tell you what happens when you have three daughters. After the first one, you get a little softer. Like you thought you were a man, but you get a little softer. And then you have a second daughter, and you get a little softer. And then you have a third daughter, and you get a little softer. And then you buy those three daughters a female puppy on Christmas morning. Then you become an emotional nightmare. Everything makes me cry now. I cry over everything. Danielle can keep a straight face and look at me, and I'm crying. And I'm like, what's wrong with you, woman? I mean, you just are an emotional wreck. And I start giving this, this individual this word that I felt the Holy Spirit was giving me to give them. But I started getting emotional. I started choking up. And then on my way home, after that Sunday morning service, I was embarrassed by that. I started, you know, why did you cry for? There's no crying in church. You know, I, why did you cry for? And I'm like, you know, but every once in a while, the Holy Spirit requires us to not be so professional and, and dignified. I think men probably struggle with this more than women do, but every once in a while, God wants a grown man to cry. He wants a grown man to get into the presence of the Lord and say, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to lift my hands and I'm going to let tears flow down my face and I'm going to bow before His presence because He's King of Kings and He's Lord of Lords and He's worthy of it all. He's worthy. Psalm 50 and verse 23 says, Whoever offers praise glorifies God. And to him who orders his conduct aright, God will show his salvation. The word praise in this verse is the Hebrew word talda. It is commonly found the talda praise in connection with a sacrificial praise. Hebrews chapter 13 says, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, right? Which is the fruit of our lips. The Tauda praise is a praise that we give God that says, I really don't feel like doing this right now. It's a, it's a sacrificial praise. Listen, you're going to go through seasons in your life. Maybe you're in one right now. Where praise is not the natural thing for you. It's not the natural tendency. Like we were talking about this morning, like in the fiery trials of life, the valleys of our life, sometimes it's not easy to praise God. Sometimes it doesn't come natural to give God praise, but the Tal Da praise is a sacrificial praise that has nothing to do with your emotions or the way you feel. It is a praise that says, God, I'm going to praise you anyway. In spite of my circumstance. In spite of the way I feel right now. I really don't feel like doing this right now, but here I go. I'm going to lift my hands. And I'm going to sing a song. And I'm going to praise you even in the storms of life. You know, I thought about the word hinge. When I was looking at this type of praise, the word hinge, you know, like a door hinge, right? You know that something, a mechanism that the door swings open and closed. And I thought about 
a lot of times that's what praise is for us. A lot of times praise is hinged upon how we feel. A lot of times praise is hinged upon how things are going in our life, right? I think all of us as human beings deal with this to, to a certain degree. Like, like I got the job promotion this week and everything's going great, so I'm going to come to church Sunday and I'm going to praise God. But next week we're going through hell and everything's going wrong, so I'm not going to come to church and I'm not going to praise God. And that's, church, that's not praise. Right, We're hinging our praise off of what we feel and our emotions. But you know, praise is not a calling. Praise is a commandment. The Bible says, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath give God praise. It's not always about how we feel. It's not always about, well, I'm on the mountaintop and God's blessed me, so I'm going to give Him praise. But even when I'm going through hell and nothing is going right in my life, I'm going to give God this Tao Da praise right now. I'm going to offer Him the sacrifice of my praise. And this is the kind of praise that will pull you out of any pit and it will push you into victory. This is the kind of praise that can pull you out of depression, pull you out of discouragement, pull you out of defeat, and push you into the joy of the Lord. There's power in our praise. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas were beaten with rods and thrown into prison, I doubt seriously that they felt like praising God in that moment. If anybody has the right in this moment to be complaining and murmuring. God, we're out here preaching the gospel. We're out here doing your work. We're out here doing what you've told us to do and called us to do. And it's gotten us beaten. We've got wounds on our bodies. We're in a prison cell in chains around our hands and our feet. That's not what they did. They begin to offer God the sacrifice of praise. You know what the Bible says? It says prison doors begin to open and chains begin to fall off. When they begin to give God that sacrificial praise that said, I don't feel like this right now, but I'm going to give this to the Lord. All of a sudden, chains start falling. Prison doors start opening. And you know what I love about that story? Is the people that weren't even singing and praising their chains fell off too. And their prison doors open too. You can praise God tonight for somebody that's not even here. You can praise God tonight for that lost family member that there looks like there's no hope for. And God can cause through your praise the chains to fall off in their life. There's power in our praise. Praise will pull you out of the pit and push you into victory. What I love about this story, and I'm almost finished, is that not only did Judah or praise go to fight for Joseph, that younger generation, but it was a threefold cord that was in operation because Reuben, the oldest son, the older generation, He began to fight for Joseph too. I want to say to the church tonight that our young people are under attack. The devil has an agenda. And it's nothing new. He has no new tricks. Do you know at our church we have Wednesday night small groups and our men's group right now is in the book of Daniel. When you open up the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, the very first thing you're going to read about is how the children of Israel are brought to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar wipes out Jerusalem. He brings back thousands of Israelites to Babylon as his slaves, as his captives. The Bible says that he takes the youth, the young people, and he commands that for three years they be indoctrinated with the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. He said, you're going to eat like us, you're going to eat like Babylonians, you're going to live like Babylonians, and you're going to be educated with our education. 
The Chaldeans were people who worshipped a pantheon of gods. Not only were they pagan worshippers who believed in a false god, they believed in multiple gods. In other words, the Chaldeans said, worship who you want to. Uh, just, just worship any old god. And he indoctrinates the youth. And what we're seeing in our generation is we're seeing our young people are under attack. They're being taught things that are not from the Word of God. They're being taught things that are not in the Bible. I, I don't want to get in trouble here, but, but they're not being taught the book of Genesis that there's a God and there's a Creator. And He spoke the earth into existence. And He formed man from the dust of the ground and a woman from the, from the ribs of a man. And, and they're being taught that we're here by by a big bang theory, a, a fireball that, that, that was in the universe and just kept expanding and growing and stretching and has been since the beginning of time and evolution. We got here from other living organisms, but that's just not true. That's indoctrination. And you know what this generation needs right now? You know what our young people need? They need some Rubens. They need some moms and dads. They need some grandparents that say, you know what? We're going to fight for Joseph. And we're not going to let the enemy kill Joseph. And devil, if you want Joseph, if you want our children, you got to come through us to get them. In the name of Jesus Christ, the church needs some Rubens. The Bible says there's a time for peace. And the same Bible says there's a time for war. And there's a time to fight. And this generation needs Reuben. It says, I'm not going to let you kill him. You're not going to shed his blood. I'm going to get him out of that pit. Reuben let his brothers know, if you want to kill Joseph, you got to come through me to do it. There's just something glorious about the Joseph generation and the Reuben generation together declaring he shall be praised. You know what happens to me every time I get around your pastor? I realize how much wisdom there is here. And I realize how much I can learn from this couple that sits on the front row. He's a Reuben. I'm not calling him old. He's still young. He's still young. He's older, not old. There's a difference. But he's been pastoring longer than me. He's seen things I haven't seen yet. He's experienced things I haven't experienced. There's something beautiful when the younger and the older come together for the same cause. He shall be praised. He shall be glorified in my life. Psalm 92 and verse 1. And I'm, I'm getting ready to close. <laughs> I like that. I wish my church did that when I said I'm getting ready to close. When I say I'm getting ready to close at my church, they're like, hey man, thank you, Jesus. Psalm 92 and verse 1. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. This is the Hebrew word. The word praises in this verse is the Hebrew word Zamar, and it means to sing with instruments. It means to make music accompanied by the voice. Why do we sing every time we come to church? Why do we start service off with music and with instruments and with singing? Because the Bible says, come before the Lord. Come before His presence with singing. And the Zamar praise is to sing and to make music with instruments. God gets glory out of this. He takes pleasure in this. When they come up here and they begin to bang on the drums and play the strings and the keyboard, and the, God is glorified. The Bible said He inhabits the praises of His people. He is, David said, He is enthroned in the midst of our praise. Do you know what that means? It means that the throne of God is mobile. 
I love that. It means that wherever people begin to collectively praise the Lord, God moves His throne into the midst of that praise. There is power. How many want God to walk in this room tonight and put His throne down in the midst of us? Well, He lives in our praise. He dwells in our praise. And the Zamar praise is to praise Him with music, to praise Him with instruments, to praise Him with singing. And finally, Psalm 150 and verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. We're in His sanctuary tonight. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. How many know that He's great tonight? And He's greatly to be praised. Here comes this Zamar praise. Praise Him with the trumpet sound. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the tambourine and the dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with the sounding cymbals. Praise Him with the loud clashing cymbals. I know pastors dealt with this before, but some people say, it's too loud in here. <laughs> Turn it down. The music's too loud. The Bible says, praise Him with the loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. If you've got breath in your lungs tonight, why don't you lift up a praise to Him right now all over this house? Come on. Come on. He gave you that breath. If you got a heartbeat tonight, why don't you lift up your hands? Why don't you lift up a shout of praise in this room tonight? Come on. He inhabits the praises of His people. He sets His throne down in the midst of our praise. I close with this. Psalm 63 and verse 3. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Everybody say praise. So I will bless you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. Finally, the word praise in this verse is the Hebrew word shabak. It means to address in a loud tone with loud adoration and a shout. To Shabbat the Lord is to proclaim with a loud voice, unashamed, the glory and the triumph and the power and the mercy and the love of the Almighty God. Will you right now together with me before we go any further, will you begin to Shabbat the Lord with me? Will you lift up a loud voice? Come on, will you begin to magnify Him? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. Come on in this place, all over this room right now. Come on, there's power in your praise. Praise will pull you out of the pit tonight. And it'll push you into victory. It'll push you into blessing. It'll push you into joy. It'll push you into triumph. In the name of Jesus. We say tonight, devil, you can't have our praise. You cannot have our worship in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you're here tonight and you need something from God, they're going to sing this song. They sang it this morning. It's a beautiful song. But if you're here tonight and you need a healing in your body, if you need a touch from the Lord, if there's anything you're seeking God about tonight, I want you to come to the front. I want to pray for you. I want you to lift up your hands. And I want you to begin to praise God in whatever storm you're going through tonight. He will meet you where you are. There's power in your praise. Wandering into the night. Hallelujah. Wanting a place behind this weary soul. Come on and sing it, Gabriel. Let's Just worship the Lord the together tonight. And I try with all my might. All who will, let's but gather around the altar. I just can win the fight. Let's I'm gather around and go out on a praise tonight. Let's magnify the Lord tonight. A vagabond. Hallelujah. And just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. Oh. 
you turn me around You place my feet on solid ground I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Oh, because you healed my heart You changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior I thank God Come on, put those hands together, let's praise Him tonight I thank God 